episode 732 of Lucas Tigers and Bronze. Oh my, please share, like, subscribe if you find our content valuable, funny, engaging, whatever it is. Please, please, please tell a friend, tell an enemy, tell a neighbor. And today, get, today's guest is uh, the well-respected Mr. Tracy Hackler. And this is an episode I think you're going to want to go back and listen to a few times. There's going to be some, hey, these are some events going on at National. Your guy's logo is everywhere. You're putting on a trade night. You're doing a ton of stuff. So there's that angle of it. Like, if I'm going to National, what should I do? A good episode for that. Good episode to get to know Tracy as well. His origin story. We'll cover that. And also, what's going on in the world of cards from a macro standpoint? So that's kind of the vibe today. Tracy, welcome to the show. It's amazing to have you, man. Well, it's amazing to be here. I love you guys. Uh, I love what y'all do. Love your passion, your energy, your your insight, and just who you guys are. So I'm honored to be here. And but Tracy, do you like baseball? Because if you do, watch as much of it as you can now, because it's going away. It's um, I'm not a I'm not a huge baseball guy, but <laughs> <laughs> he's making your point, Andrew. You gotta love it. <laughs> Oh, People loved yesterday's episode. They love when Cage and I debate. <laughs> but hopefully today is less about Cage and I arguing virtually and more about Tracy. And, and I'm curious, you know, you're with Texas Roadshow now. Uh, you introduced us to Jimmy, which was amazing. That was one of my favorite episodes, sitting oh, yeah. at VCon on the floor. Uh, it, it was so much fun. It'll be one I'll remember for the rest of my life. Give us your origin story, you know, your 60, 90 seconds of – how you got to the hobby, your time at Panini, and a little bit about kind of how you found yourself here. Huh. So grew up collecting like so many people. I'm way old. So I started collecting in the late 70s with my brother um, and then kind of had it as a passion from that point on. Like a lot of people missed out on, on the high school, college years because I was focused on other things. But I ended up getting an internship as a journalism major in college, and I ended up getting an internship at Beckett back in 95. Uh did my best to kind of parlay that into a full-time job at the first opportunity did that so i was at beckett for five years from 95 to 2000 went to work for donruss doing pr advertising marketing from 2000 to 04 went back to beckett in a different role for six more years and then went to panini uh in 2010 for 11 years to do marketing pr social media stuff for them and then had a run in with Jimmy Mayhem. We all know him and love him. And he, like uh, he run in, like a run in, <laughs> no, 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 like, a, <laughs> like a, like we met. Um, and he <laughs> was starting up this uh trading card shop franchise, and and he is a compelling uh speaker. And he sold me on his vision and his heart and his head. And so I started here in late December, and it's been a whirlwind, but a lot of fun. I don't know if you saw a post from Cajun Cardboard, uh, but he got a uh, graded Beckett magazine. Were you, when you were at Beckett, were you putting those together? So I was, yeah, I was doing a lot of the magazines, um, started doing the notes sections back in 95, like rewriting company press releases back when companies did press releases and um, doing like a, a feature writing and, and trend topic stuff on the industry back then. And then kind of work my way up to associate publisher level at some point. And, um, but yeah, cover selection and cover blurbs and what was going in that month's issues, all those things I did uh, and loved it. I loved it. Yeah, and no shortage of content in the 90s. I mean, George, no. Jack, uh, it was, the, it was like the, the golden era of cards. Yeah. Is that oh, my God. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, back when Topps Chrome first hit and Kobe was a, a kid and people were going nuts up nuts about that technology and that card and um nolan ryan kind of was big even though he was a little older and but yeah Shaq and all the 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 kind of explosion of the primarily football and ba basketball because baseball kind of led the way for the the getting mainstream attention but the basketball and football markets really exploded back in that late 80s early 90s so um yeah no shortage of content for sure I got to tell you the you know after meeting um, you know you and meeting uh, Jimmy right it, it just like it it works right I mean like you know you can tell when you meet folks in the hobby and we've met a lot I mean Andrew does a, a, a just a killer job of of all the behind the scenes like every bit of behind the scenes that every person who comes on here it's like this is who I'm getting on today we've met a lot of people you can yeah. just tell when it's gonna work you and you're a hobby lifer. 
but the, the, you just kind of you know, same as him when he came on. You just kind of like radiate hobby love. You know what I mean? It's like no matter what, it doesn't matter if it's Donruss, it doesn't matter if it's Beckett, it doesn't matter if it's Panini. Like it didn't. You didn't go through your origin story and say, well, you know, my time at Donruss that was really terrible. You know, and then Beckett was like, they're like a dinosaur. And you just you went through. You what your what your role was. You had an appreciation for all of it. You learned something new, and. I mean, that's a heck of a journey, right? 95 to 2022, you know, you're talking about like a 27 year career within the, you know, within the, 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 the marketing side, but for, for these bigger companies, right? I'm not calling the roadshow a startup, it is, but, it's, I mean, but, it's, is. but it's a different kind of vibe. What do you take with you from that 27 years into what you're building here now? Besides well, obviously a love of the hobby. Yeah, so appreciate you saying that. Like, I'm a I'm a glass half full guy. Always have been. God bless me with that disposition. I know that we're all wired differently, and that's what makes everything work, right? Some people work better under stress, under anger, under depression. Like, but they need different motivators. But I'm a glass half full guy. I um, always have been, and so I I truly value opportunities that have been made for me, whether I've kind of help make those opportunities myself, but I, I'm always thankful and I want to m- m- make sure people aren't disappointed in, in recommending me or making an opportunity. So um, I've got nothing to be, to be bad about. I, I have tried to learn things every step of the way. And the thing that really I love the most about where I've been is it's always the people that make it so worthwhile. It's because the, yeah, the subject matter is cool, man. I collected cards, and if you told eight-year-old me what I was going to be doing for a living, I would have told you you were nuts, right? <laughs> but so I'm thankful for that. But the people, more than anything else, are the things that that I tend to collect more than cards. It's just the smiles, the stories, being in the trenches at, at shows or uh, late nights, early mornings, all those things. I love that stuff. And then what I've tried to learn along the way is just. Um, paying it forward and, and leading with positivity. And I think that's one of the things that really struck me about Jimmy. So paying it forward within the hobby community, having positivity, glass half full, and going about your business in a way where you are mindful of the fact that someone recommended you for that job and you're now a reflection on that other member of the hobby community. It's yep. funny that over the last five minutes, this is what you're talking about. Because Andrew told me, a couple weeks ago, and I got to tell you, dead on, dead on accurate, that 2022, the hobby is going to be less about what cards people are buying and selling and more about what community is being built. Mm-hmm. And everything you're talking about is about that. And you learn more about the hobby, the community of the hobby during a time where it's not to the moon, we're all making money, you can make a mistake and make money. When, it, when it's harder, when, you're, when there's more work being put in and when there's more flatline, maybe some stuff even going down – it's where this community, it's where your optimism, it's where, you know, the, we get to learn about people like you on shows like this. It's, it's where you do the national comes and everybody gets together and does their stuff that yep. the community of the hobby is what shines through. And I think that may actually lead to the next leg up in valuation. It's funny how that works and they're intertwined, you know? Yeah, it really is. I mean, I, I, that's always been, that's what it's always been about for me is because look, I was the same dude back in 2011, 12, 13, when things weren't selling, right? And the market wasn't where it was. And um, I've been on the roller coaster a long time and I've seen it, but I've always loved it. And it, again, it comes down to the people. Like it's not, it's so cliche to say, find something you love to do and you never work a day in your life. But it's, it's kind of true. Like I'm not the old cliche guy, but I'm just, it, 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 it just works for me. And I'm so thankful and blessed that it is. I'm curious about something because I agree with you. I was going to ask that same thing, Cage, but I'll, I'll ask like a, a slightly different version is how much has social media impacted what we do? Like I, I see posts and I feel like everything right now is very much influencer driven, uh, like narratives, prices, influencer driven because of social media. How was that always that way? Like with Beckett magazine, I mean, Beckett was an influence. How has that changed or it maybe it hasn't changed, just evolved? Um, I think it's grown because now really anybody and everybody can be an influencer, right? Like one of the reasons Beckett works so well when Dr. Beckett launched, who loved Dr. Beckett too, legend, pioneer, 
Hall of Famer, gave me a chance. Um, so, so, but he was the voice, right? He was the influencer. He he dictated. He, he didn't intend to dictate prices, but he dictated prices. Um, but now when social media exploded, it's so great. A lot of my livelihood has revolved around social media, um, but it everybody kind of can impact things differently. And But I think going back to positivity and kind of educating yourself, like you need that more than ever because a lot of social is not always positive. It's tearing people down, tearing cards down. Tearing well, it's not always true either, right? Like you have to some degree. You have yeah. to go get school, go to school. You have to meet the president of an established company, respect, and he, he puts his stamp of approval on someone like you and says, all right, this guy knows what he's talking about. We're going to have yeah. an editor as well, and this will go out. Now, yeah. someone could just like be really good at creating content. They could put anything out. How do we even separate facts from fiction? Right, right. It's really difficult. And like so – one of the one of the issues I think in our society at large is n- nobody really wants to truly educate themselves on some things because it's that's that's difficult to do. It takes work to like do research and know what's real and what's not. And um, nobody, not nobody, a lot of people don't want to go through that legwork of educating themselves. So if something that some bright shiny thing attracts their attention, that's their influence and that's that must be true and um so people just have to be careful it's like going into a hobby shop now if you haven't collected in in 10 years you're not just gonna buy a box because it's or whatever you need to know what that box might have in it what what it, the prices are in other places and it, it, just do your research and homework and i think all right cage can i ask one question will, this was going to be saved for the sure. end but but just because of what tracy said i had a question for you so tracy you worked at panini Correct. Yes, sir. What's in the box? So it was under. It was my impression <laughs> that in first off the line, there could only be shimmer products. Is okay. that true? Can you pull gold and black out of first off the line? Well, gold and black shimmer. Gold and black shimmer, I think, is only FOTL, right? Yes. I think the so shimmer is. I. So he's asking this for a reason, right? Oh yeah. Because something just got pulled, right? Is this like a, a Kate Cunningham, right? Or something like that? Is that what yeah. Kate Cunningham Black, not the Black Shimmer, got pulled mm-hmm. last night. And right. it got pulled off the first off the line box. And I'm sitting here thinking, I thought first off the line, when I got into the hobby 2019, people are both, was Shimmer, right? It was Blue Shimmer, Gold Shimmer. Oh, I, I get what you're saying. Off- I get what you're saying now. So there, there are regular prisms in first off the line, but you can only find Shimmer, those certain Shimmer exclusives in FOTL. Okay. So well, that was my question, guys. I was going to save that till the end, but I wanted to drop it in because we were talking about wax and products and all that yeah. stuff. It was, I wanted to hear it from the legend's mouth himself. Ah. It's okay. No one's going to hear this. Chet Holmgren just emailed me and said that he wants the whole episode pulled off of the air. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that was really Chet? <laughs> I, who the hell knows? <laughs> you know, today's day and age, you never know. You never know. I mean, he's got Bowman University cards. You would like to think that the licensing is proper, but you never know, man. You never know. But we can't put this episode up. Sorry, Tracy. I mean, <laughs> Chet Holmgren says no. So, so take us to – you're now with Texas Rocho, right? The, What's, yeah, Rocho cards. Ro- Rocho cards. Have you been there a year, a year and a half? No, uh, late December. Late December. So I've been here like six months-ish. Well, you guys have – it, this is as ambitious, you know, a hobby shop as I've seen. You guys want to expand all over the country, you know, bring joy to every city. You know, you guys do a ton of giveaways, you know, a ton of like kind of local outreach. What's your, what, what have you been working on mostly? What should people know about it and how could they kind of support what you guys are doing what's going on? So thank you for that. So Roadshow Cards, uh, Jimmy Mahan started it in Lexington, Kentucky with the Kentucky Roadshow. His vision was always to, to, to grow across the country. So we opened the Texas Roadshow, which I'm in now, uh, last month. Uh, New York Roadshow opens next month. And then later this summer, probably after the national, the California Roadshow will open. And, and not then, to be confused with Texas Roadhouse, right? Correct. Which they have good bread at Texas Roadhouse. Um, and I think Patrick Swayze was in a great Roadhouse movie too. But um, uh, His name uh, is Dalton. That wasn't <laughs> – that wasn't in Texas, though. But um, 
so yeah, so so kind of get all four shops up and running. Uh, each shop is geographically different, but the vibe, the vision is the same. Grow the community, elevate the hobby, one customer at a time, one transaction at a time. Uh, Jimmy always says, we want it to be more transformational than transactional. I'm sure he said that on the show with you guys. And he, that's not just a cool cliche. Like, that's how he lives his life, and that's how I I want to live mine, too. So, so the, you should shots. repeat some of the stuff that he said because I don't remember hearing or seeing anything. The smile was it's blinding. <laughs> That's all I remember. Jimmy was on, there was a huge smile. That's the whole and it's all true, dude. He had so much fun with you guys. Um, and I he's just great, he's a great spirit. And like when the, the thing about when he talked to me about this position, it really made no sense, right? I'm why would I go from the giant to this small startup? Um but he really hit me in places I didn't even think I could be hit. Like it was so emotional and more about the heart and the head than it was and the faith than it was about whatever prism. I mean, it was so it, it really struck me at a, at a place I just wasn't anticipating. And um, so I'm like, yeah, I'm in. I mean, so anyway, I That's mean, listen, life. I thought his self was just, they don't have licenses anymore. Come on over the road. <laughs> that wasn't it. It should have been. It should have been. Um, yeah. Well, you, I remember retail is a special beast. Like retail isn't for everybody. Mm -hmm. And honestly, a lot of times retail doesn't make money. And if it does, it's not like this million dollar conglomerate where, you know, unless you get to huge scale, it's, it's a very difficult business, but it's a business where you can impact a lot of lives. You have sure. a lot of foot traffic. Right. Yep. You yep. have not only of people coming into the story of people on your now we have digital and all that stuff. So you could impact lives day after day after day. And I remember going from like Wall Street to a startup as well. I worked for BlackRock and then I went to a 10 person company. I was like, I could have more impact. I could leave more of my heart and soul into how this company uh, grows and becomes bigger than yep. I could at a, at a big Fortune 500 company. There's only so much you could do. You're a piece. That's a great point. You're absolutely right. And like, I never really fancied myself as the older guy, but I'm kind of the oldest guy in the company, which strikes me as weird because I don't act old and I don't feel old, but but it's true. And what that come, brings with it, I hope, is enough experience to kind of help mold a lot of the younger guys running the shops because because it's a different generation. Like, it's immediate now. I want it right now. I want it right now. And it's like, we're in a marathon. We're not in a sprint. Like it's going to be okay. Like, so anyway, trying to impact lives like that, like you said, and then the people that you meet that come into the shop that where you really, Jimmy lives it and it, he makes lives better in small ways sometimes, right? It doesn't have to be huge, but it's like, it, it's so true that people say, you never know what somebody else is going through. So just be nice. Because it can change the whole tra trajectory of their spirit, of their what they're going through, and and you hear that, Cage? Yesterday, yeah. after you told me I'm a terrible public speaker, you don't know what I was going through. <laughs> yeah, I don't. But whatever it is, it was worse. It was worse after that. <laughs> I definitely made it worse. Andrew's Andrew's uh, what love you... language is positive affirmations, and yes. so so I go the exact other way. I have a question for you. Cage. Negative affirmations. Yes. 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 When we started this podcast, and this is why I love yeah. capitalism. Capitalism has its flaws. But when we started this yeah. podcast, there were zero, zero uh, sports card and hobby shops in New York City. Correct. Now you have Bleaker Lounge, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coffee Breakers just joined in. Right. Texas Roadshow, which is like a true hobby house. Got it won't be Texas in New York, right? It'll be New York, New York Roadshow. Road yeah, New York Roadshow. Road yeah. <laughs> New York Roadshow, I apologize. <laughs> I mean, I think, and don't correct me, Black, Black Jaded Wolf, Wolf kind of has, has like a showroom yep. uh, yeah, Black store. Bullpen. 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 I'm running out of hands. I mean, if, if that's it's, not. It's more than I remember within the city proper ever. Mm -hmm. Because even yeah. in, in 03, there were a couple of stores. There were a couple downtown. You know, like the city real estate is not cheap. Rent is not no. cheap, you know, within the city. It's definitely not. Um, and for a while, there was one store. Um, Chameleon yep. Cards and Comics on Maiden Lane, downtown Manhattan, and that was the last one to you know to close down. And now, boom, it's up again. But yeah, the flip side, Andrew, is I think if we counted four or five right now, um, I will say 
by 2024. Are you doing the baseball thing? There'll be three of them. Yeah. Not all of them are going to survive. Because this is not the way it works. And that doesn't mean they're going to fail. Maybe there'll be some consolidation. Maybe, you know, two of them will get together, sort of like you saw Coffee Breaker and Bleaker do. Um, that's kind of the way that it works. And that's just that's not about just the, the you know, the, 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 you know the, the store. That's everything. That's the grading companies. You know, there were 117 grading companies last year. You know, there's like one now. So, yeah. you know, I mean, you know it's, it's, just, it's just what happens. There's consolidation. Everybody kind of goes out and does their thing. But the roadshow guys, what we talked to Jimmy about and why I know they will be there is they're not planning with a six-month runway yeah. and saying, all right, we have enough money where we need to really knock this out of the park by the end of 2022 or we're going to have to shutter yeah. the doors. Like that's yeah. not their plan. So, you know, they are already setting this up for, you know, a short term, tougher haul. Yeah. Um, and if everything breaks, great, great for them. But, you know, they know that it's not the easiest. You can't just, you know, turn it on. Yeah. Not everybody has the same type of, 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 of roadmap as breakers do here. You know, if you want to yeah. be a breaker, boom, you can make a million dollars yeah. just next week. And Jimmy could have done that. He could have bought a <laughs> warehouse and, and had. 35 people in a room breaking cards around the clock, but that's not his vision. That's not what he he got from his hobby shop when he was coming up. And it's not what he wants to, to pay forward to future generations of card card collectors. And um, so, so I'm curious about something. I, I'm wondering, I mean, you know, your business from the inside, I just see it from the outside. Why has no one or have people thought about, um, pack delivery like through uber eats or through GoPuff or through some of these logistics companies right being able to deliver packs not a whole box not thousands of but a, you know thirty dollars five dollars include it like kind of like include this with my chick-fil-a order yeah, yeah, yeah. Of cards. is that that's a great crazy, idea crazy thought it's no I, it's not crazy i think it's great i think the only thing i could think of off the top of my head that would cause pause would be like the the fear of shrinkage and because you know, I mean, the people are, and not like jumping in the pole shrinkage, but like <laughs> packs disappearing because th they're valuable. Like, if you want to run by Chick Fil A and the road show and get a pack of Prism, I mean, there's a chance that the driver might not make it to your house. Or understand, understand. But that's the only. But, but I love the, I love the idea, for sure. Where. For people that don't know, where are you guys? Uh, where are you guys going to be located? So we are in New York. You're talking about, or yeah. so in New York, we're in Bronxville, um, 65 Pondfield Road. I haven't been to that location. That's the only location I haven't been to. But I'm going Monday in advance of next week's uh, grand opening. So Pondfield, I guess Westchester uh, County or whatever, um, where apparently it's where Roger Goodell lives. Is what I. What I've been it's told. a very nice neighborhood. It's a, it is not a part of the of New York City proper. It yeah. is a suburb. It's north of the city. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it because it's um, it's going to be cool. And the guy that like that's what I love about Jimmy's model is yeah, it's the road show, but it's also unique to to that area. The the guy running it is from that area. He's a longtime collector. The guy running Texas is from this area. And, um, Likewise in Kentucky, likewise in Sonoma, California, when the California Road Show opens. See, this is what I, I mean. you got to work in like some local flavor into this. Everybody's got their ideas, and they're just going to tell you how to run your business, right? I mean, the Kentucky Road Show, you got to give away some bourbon. Texas, you yeah. got to give them some barbecue. When they get the New yes. York store open, every pack, you get the middle finger. I mean, like, you know, it's like you got to put some local flavor into it, no? Yeah, you're right. Maybe not the middle finger. Maybe like some pizza or something. I don't know. <laughs> no, my, that would have been less funny. But yeah, pizza is a good idea. Pizza is a good idea. <laughs> Last two well, questions. First thing, uh, national. So he's the eighth, three weeks away. What should people listening to this show kind of be on the lookout for national? So first of all, come by the Roadshow Cards booth because we're going to have like four corners, Texas, New York, California, uh, Kentucky. Four uh, booths? Four, one booth, four corners. So it's I like, like all the Cool. All the shops are represented. In the middle of the booth will be some chairs to come talk. Is you guys know Jimmy loves to talk. So, um, and then trade night, obviously uh, the that Jimmy and Ryan Johnson card collector who started many many years ago, um, continues to grow. It's now the official trade night of the national on Thursday night. Um, that will be a blast. 
I've never personally attended one, so this will be my first. I've supported it from uh, Panini in years past, but this will be the first year I get to. I get to. Packed. Yes, it's going to be crazy. And the average age is like 14. It's unbelievable. And, and rolling around with Zion cases of cash, yes. just making deals. Um, so Here's but, my he, advice, Andrew. Andrew, make sure you have a bottle of water and uh, like a, a phone charger. No, but for the road show, if you want to make, you want to be slick. Bring top loaders. Last year, people were like making trades and stuff. They didn't have top loaders. Remember, I had oh, to buy one. Of, you know, one of, I was. I had to buy somebody top. I think I paid seven dollars for a pack of top loaders. <laughs> Sell picks night. and shovels. It wasn't even a full. It wasn't even a full. It was like you know, there were like three missing. Yeah, yeah. you're like seven. That's some well, supplies. That's good. That's good advice, yeah. The, <laughs> the national look. Atlantic City is not my favorite national city, but it's still the national and. The thing I love about, about the National, I've been, I think I went to my first one back when it was in Arlington, like in 86 or something. Um, and what I do with the National is I talk to everybody. Like it's just that time where you, and it's also why trade nights in general are so successful. It's people that we deal with socially um, and never get to meet and talk to, we get to meet them, shake their hands, hug them, dap them up and, um, I love that. I love hearing stories about what people collect, why they collect things. I want to hear about their hardships and problems that they might have with, with me or with the company or, or, or anything. It's, it's just invaluable time for that t- type of stuff. And, oh, yeah, you can get the, any card you're looking for probably there as well. Do you think Nashville should be like a, a petition or, uh, you know, something I want to start is let National to Vegas. But, but then yeah. people said Dallas is an amazing location. Do you think yeah. national should be moved around year over year, or do you think a set location is actually more enticing? So I, I don't hate it moving around, right? Like it, because they used to move it around, and it was Chicago, Cleveland, uh, Anaheim every now and then. And now it's like Cleveland, Chicago, Atlantic City, because I don't know what kind of deal they have with Atlantic City, but uh, hopefully they don't – it's not – there anymore so i would be fine if they came out tomorrow and said we're only having the national in chicago every year like that would be cool like i'd be fine with that i think most people would be fine with that but if they said we're going to move it like the all-star game or like the draft as long as it makes sense as a as a town why not because it helps all those areas and easy to get there too is, is super important like if you have to fly in and then drive another two hours Man, it causes a lot of friction. <laughs> people. As it currently stands, I don't know how I'm getting to national. We'll figure it out. <laughs> we're fly- Wait, where are you? Where are you guys located? I'm in Florida. Just moved there, but I, we have family in Philadelphia. So, like Atlantic City is actually kind of where we go. We go to the Jersey Shore. That's where mm-hmm. I grew up going. Cage is uh, on, on, not in, on Long Island. Weird. Okay. Yes. He's yeah. in the Hamptons. This podcast has been really <laughs> yeah. good to him. Yes. One Very day. good. Awesome. He says, I don't know how I'm getting there. It's, am I taking my Rolls Royce or my convertible Bentley? <laughs> I don't yeah. know if it's raining that day yet. That's <laughs> convertible Bentley. All right. Let's rock. I like it. Cage, I want to roll with you, bro. Yeah, it's me too. I want to roll with that version of me too. <laughs> Are you, are you coming from New York? Will you be in New York? The you know card ladder has an event. There's some stuff going on with Bleaker that week. Or are you going so- directly AC? We're going to so we're going to Philadelphia. So so I'll be in New York next week. Come back Friday, prep for a few more weeks, and then head to Philadelphia. And then to we have to fly to Philadelphia and then drive to to, to Atlantic City. So I'll be doing that. Final question. We'll let you go. Okay. Ebbs and flows of business, right? You got in ninety five, ninety six, ninety seven. Amazing, sort of like people who got in 2019, 2020, 2021. Incredible. Yeah. Then you know you saw, like you said, 2011. You couldn't sell anything. How? What advice do you have for collectors and business owners to ride these ebbs and flows of, of this of the hobby? So for collectors, like I, I guess you have to really soul search why you're collecting in the first place. If you're looking to get rich quickly, I mean. Again, it takes research and patience. And if, like, so many people that jumped in the last few years, like, they didn't see it down here, right? They saw it like right up here. And then if it falls to here, they think the sky is falling, not knowing that we've been in it since it was here. Um, so I think you need perspective. 
you need some kind of education and you need patience if you're a collector. But another thing Jimmy also says all the time, and I'm a firm believer in this, if you collect what you love, you're never disappointed. So I got a lot of Broncos cards. If any of the failed bit Broncos quarterbacks, uh, Brock Osweiler, Drew Locke, not that he's a complete failed bit yet, uh, Paxton Lynch, if they ever pan out any, anywhere, I've got a gold mine because they're all going to – but I'm not – I don't hate those cards. I love them. I love the memories they bring me of them coming in. and so, so They're going to collect- morph. Right. You're going to have Drew Locke's confidence. Paxton Lynch competitive spirit and Brock Osweiler's height. You're going to morph those cards. That would be a, a bionic quarterback. So I think if uh, patience, perspective, you got to have those, and passion, not to be three Ps, but I think those three things are are vital. And then for well, business. There you have it. Tracy Hacker goes P all over the hobby, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's the episode title of the day. One little addition before you hit into that go from hobby into business. Yeah. Guys, just to take his story forward, right? If you're in this long enough, if you were in this 90s, 2000s, 2011, the here, the floor that Tracy's talking about, it went from there to here, right? Now you're seeing it come down. That's now the new floor. And it may yeah. take a little bit of time, right? But it's setting a new... And when it goes up, you get to ride from that floor up right. here instead of jumping in at the midpoint or on its way up and only seeing a little bit or watching it only come down. It's just right. a matter of it's a matter of when. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you've now seen it happen several times so during times. the course of your career. All right, into the business side. Sorry. In the business, I think another thing that I that I love is like and this is another thing Jimmy used to sell me this on this new opportunity that he gave me was if you do right by people, the money will come, the business will succeed. And it seems so simple, but it's so like, I firmly believe it. Like if you just do people right, you're going to be okay. I mean, don't be irrational and foolish and don't make rash decisions with your business, but just treat people as your number one commodity and value them and love them and, and, and do right by them, whether they're your own employees or your customers. Man, I think everything else is going to be okay. Helps you sleep at night, too. I love it. I love the thought yeah. process, right? I mean, you know, it's one of those things, right? I mean, not to get too faith-based, but, you know, it works in the hobby and it works in business, right? You know, like you try to treat people the way you'd want to be treated. It yes. sounds easy and cliche. It doesn't happen as much as it should. But, uh, I, I mean, I, I love it. I really do. I think, I think that's one thing that, that we're missing as a society, not – collecting but like we're somewhere we lost the ability to love people like just to to be good to people like why is that so difficult sometimes whether i don't care what got rich as a country yeah i don't care what you believe politically or or your christianity or your faith like i don't care i'm gonna be good to you because that's what i think i should i should do i should be good to you and so anyway that not to get all philosophical but I wish we were better to each other. I had this conversation with a friend. See you in three weeks. New York Roadshow. Guys, it's open in Westchester. Check it out. Uh, I'm sure you'll be seeing more posts about that. Support yes, the sir. trade night. You're not going to want to miss that. In three weeks, we got national. Stop by the booth. Say hi to Tracy. Say hi to Jimmy. Say hi to the squad. And uh, it was nice to have you. I appreciate you joining the show. Hey, I'm greatly appreciative. Love you guys. And I will look forward to seeing you all in person real soon. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you all. Dude, I was having a conversation about that, by the way. About what? About faith? About treating people the right way? Yeah, specifically what I said was um, living in Mexico gave me a lot of perspective because they're kind of like in survival mode. So they're all helping each other just for the benefit of helping each other. We got a little bit wealthy as a country these last 30. First off, thank you to Tracy for jumping on before I go all heady and philosophical. (laughs) Uh, go support them. Awesome guys. Tons of energy. Tons of positivity. But yeah, I think in a, we've lost a little bit of that like in America of like instead of just being transactional with each other, how do we kind of just be good to each other and let the chips fall where they may? I mean, it, it's interesting because I mean, I've never had a conversation with anyone about it, but I will tell you the vast majority of people do not give what I give. They definitely don't give what you give. Um, and I'm not just talking about hobby folks, but, you know, in life, 
Um, so I, I get it, you know, and it's probably why I don't have too many people that I talk to on a regular basis <laughs> because, you know, every once in a while you just kind of take a step back and you say, all right, you know, if, if you've filled your life up with people who are taking more from you than they will ever give, you know, eventually that's gotta, that's gotta stop. And, you know, put that back in the hobby, put that back in the hobby. It's interesting what? stuff, man. So people love these kind of like double header episodes. It's almost like you guys get two episodes in one, bring in a guest, kind of a little bit of the history, origin story, what's going on, current events. Let's um, have you explain yourself real quick. The, sure. the Ashton Kutcher movie. The name of it is My Boss's Daughter, which yes. sounds very much like My Cousin Vinny. It's like a similar named movie. So everybody – yeah. So, so everybody who's you know wondering why Andrew thought Ashton Kutcher was in My Cousin Vinny, that's where we go. Okay, now you can continue. About well, here I thought episodes. 730 episodes <laughs> in these, the, our audience would go from movie watchers to book readers. No, and somehow you've recruited more movie watchers. Like, <laughs> read a book, guys. You don't what need book? that much humor. How about this? Let's give you two uh, minutes. I what read it. The, what's the book in you a read? book? What's the, last, a what's the last book you read that you would recommend to people? Zoolander. No, because I read The Alchemist, man. And I got to tell you, that was some, it was some tough sledding there in the middle. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, I got to stop. I gotta put really? This, I got to put That's this such an easy read. I was like, yeah, the this story, is just, it's a, yeah, go ahead. The story of Santiago and how, I mean, he over, how he has a vision to be more than just a shepherd. Here's and where it's tough. The, you say Santiago, and all I think of is, you know, the Estadio Olimpio Santiago Chile. I built. You built the Estad. You built the Olympic Stadium in Santiago. No, no. I built the little place down there, the Calle Linde Towers. Something about Mary, you know, Matt Dillon. That's what you say, Santiago, and this is what I think of a movie quote. Even when we Every start talking I've... about books, I take it into so, movies. I'm sorry. So I don't like flying that much. Uh, I've gotten better with it, but I don't like flying. I'm lack of control, but I always listen to the Alchemist on it. You know, I don't know why. It's very, very peaceful, very calm. Why don't you like Alchemist, flying? We, I went to Germany with my dad and my grandpa, and the flight back home was the craziest turbulence. And I, it was probably the flight I realized I'm going to die one day. And I was like, fuck, I do not want to die in a plane crash. All right. We're all going to die one day, you know? We get to, yeah, I think it was the day I saw, saw my mortality. I was like 21, 20 years old. Like, fuck. Turbulence? It got me. All right. All right. So what do you got for the second half of this episode? Where I was I, outraged. I, I, outraged. About what? Outraged. The Chet Holmgren? I mean, the black pulled one, out of the one. Once, one, the one. one time is, okay, an accident. Two times, I'm like, all right, coincidence. But three times? Becky O'Brien's pulling the best card in a row of a product? What's what going about? on? Is it Becky O'Brien's? The backyard pulled it. Backyard Jordy. Yeah. So is that what you're uh, you're outraged about? Backyard pulled the one on one after pulling the one on one after pulling the one on one. I'm not outraged, <laughs> but I am grabbing the general consensus of the hobby, and I wanted to discuss it here on the show and get your thoughts. Um, the hobby's in a very different place than it was. I saw uh, the post where Chris Hodge was posting. I think you were commenting on it, maybe a story about how this, you know, the the chase card, basically the one of one of the top rookie. I mean, obviously he didn't win rookie of the year and any Scotty Barnes fans or Evan Mobley fans or whoever it is that you like as the rookie kid, Cunningham had a good year and he was the number one pick. So let's just, you know, say for now, that's the chase card. The one of one base prism was pulled before the product even was supposed to release. Um, and yet we still don't know whether or not the 2018 Luca was pulled. But here I'm going to tell you that back in 2019, you know, before the real full explosion of everything, I remember going to a show in White Plains and buying retail boxes of Prism for $100. Prism basketball, the green box, you know, no guaranteed auto in it, of course, but you know, it had all kinds of parallels and you name it in there. I'm not saying the Luca one ones in there, but what I'm saying is that it wasn't a, a phenomenon to be celebrated and broken to open a box of prism. People were just opening them. They, you know, the prices hadn't gotten, you know, ridiculous yet. There were no bounties put on these things. We're in a very different space in the hobby and there weren't people breaking 60% of the product. And I might be lowballing that. I might be breaking that much. 
breakers. No, I don't mean backyard. Oh, I mean okay. overall breakers. Just that 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 in 2018, ah. the amount of product that was broken publicly for public consumption being recorded and videotaped so that every single hit that's out there is going to be memorialized. Now it's probably two thirds of every card. That's if not more, it may even be more. Do you, right? Do you think the memorialization of the hits is actually what leads to the price? Like, I Part sort of, of think I want my cards to be ripped by. Like, if I hit that card, if I hit it in private versus hitting it on a stream of two, three, five, six, six hundred people, my card will sell better because of no one wants to like um, the, nothing draws a crowd like a crowd. Mm -hmm. That applies to this. When 600 people see that this was pulled, they tell a friend, this is all over Instagram. You create all of this demand for one card. So I think the best story that you're telling there is, let's use the triple logo, man, the greatest card in the history of time, the LeBron. Um, the story is what makes that card. The fact that people were publicly hunting for it. You know, platinum artists you know, we're hunting for that card. And then the fact that there was this whole, you know, squid game created by, you know, whatnot to do, uh, you know, get a, get a, get a, get a, a Lamborghini and, and, you know, pull the card and do it live and bring out all the influencers and wear a Viva Vendetta mask. Um, and, and Love yeah, one. that's part of the story. So yes, I, I mean, I wouldn't care and I wouldn't pay more for a box, um, you know, of prison basketball just because somebody's going to break it for me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it does drive pricing. It probably drives prices up. But would you pay for more for a box if you know the hit out of that box gets of so course. much attention? Well, like, no, I mean, if I knew it was a hit, sure. But I mean, attention, yeah. I mean, it, if the hit's big enough and you want to sell it because that's really what you're looking for, the attention – you sell it through one of the auction houses that's going to get it the attention that it needs, you know, whether you broke it privately or not. Um, so I, I understand what you're saying. And I think the price that it increases, the breaking is the price of product. If everybody was just buying these things and we weren't whipping it up into a frenzy. Cause I mean, listen, what breaking has done in my eyes and I, I think breaking is great. Right now, when you know when the hobby is you know is is going through a different period than it was last year, breakers are not feeling it because it's it's fun. People have that that disposable income; they want to do it on a gamble. They're more likely to buy a lottery ticket, cost them less to get in for that big hit instead of buying a card or buying a whole box. And breaking is an, a, a way to do that. It's so funny that Tracy talked about you know hey hiring thirty five people and put them in a warehouse. I've probably heard ten people. In the last two weeks, say that that's an idea that they're thinking of. I'm just going to get a warehouse and I'm going to put 35 people in it and just have them break product, you know, left and right. So many people are saying exactly that, right? But, but, um, I think it's actually, I don't want to say a negative of it. I've mentioned this a bunch of times. I put up posts on my Instagram of my Friday breaks with Ian. And sometimes he's smiling ear to ear because he's got a Ken Griffey Jr. redemption. We'll see if we ever actually get the auto. Sometimes he's happy, pulls a Trevor Lawrence auto in the college uniform. And the card is demolished to shit and probably grade a five. But most wow. of the time, most of the time, we're opening a $1,000 box of Prism and getting absolute shit. Now, the breakers, that's happening. People are seeing that. On any given night, the certain breakers like yeah, but tonight, they're Prism release. It. Have you? They're gamifying the fuck. It's have you seen what they do? Just stay with me. Five hundred okay. people might be watching it live, but in the one box of twenty that has a Mac Jones, that has a logo man, that has a Trevor Lawrence, that has a Kaboom, that one is then clipped up and sent out to the masses, and all of the big hits are then clipped up. Just like your problem with baseball and how basketball is much more clippable, people aren't watching the whole game. People aren't watching the whole live of five hours and seeing that 90% of the product is crap. They're seeing these snippets of monstrous whale cards being pulled, and that draws them to the breaking. It brings the price of those breaks up because people, they think, well, that's i got to break this product. I got. I got to break this card right now. That V friend is worth a billion dollars. That wrestling prism should be fifteen hundred dollars a box because look at what those cards are selling for on eBay. Look at this break, and it, it, 
I, I need a box. I got to go break a box. What you're not seeing is the other 95%. But so you can talk about the gamification because that makes it fun in the whole nine yards too. I mean, we, we, we love whatnot and we love the model. Um, and, and, you know, back well, here, what not whatnot has NFTs that sell on there and a vintage clothing. So like whatnot, it's funny. We stay in like our little niche, but if you actually like look at what, whatnot has, they have vintage people sell vintage clothing on there. It, it's, it's a Mercari, but with uh social selling on top of it. So it's not mm-hmm. just breaks. There, there's an amazing consignment show. I heard, you know, <laughs> yep. I heard that too. I heard that no, too. But, do you breakers, you know what they remind me a little bit of? And this is weird for me because I mean our Black friends dealers. Are, are breakers. Uh, uh, maybe you go that route. I go different route, but uh and it's not it, they remind me of Shrat and Oakmont from Wolf of Wall Street. The, okay. But, I mean, not, not that they're selling thing. pick sheets. Uh it's not a good thing or a bad. It's just like the vibe, like the energy, I think, is what really captivates the audience. Is like all these guys screaming, yelling, supporting. Oh my God, look at this hit. People going nuts all over it's social. So it reminds me a little bit of that. I mean, they were a full on business. And sure, I mean, maybe the breakers are the guys who are on the phone selling the stock. And, and, and probably every once in a while, they have to throw somebody. It's like Boiler Room is a better one. You know, they were, they were pitching a bunch of crap. But every once in a while, they were getting an IPO so that the company could make money. And that if someone was enough of a whale or someone was actually, you know, putting in enough money, okay, throw them some shares of the IPO that we're getting into. Throw them some shares of the good stuff so that one out of 10 people actually is a winner. I don't want to compare it to that one because it's, you know, the regulation ultimately comes and the feds come and wrap up almost every boiler room. The same thing I don't want to happen to the breakers. Why I say it's like blackjack I was going to ask you that, though. What, what the blackjack, was? because the breakers, they're the, the, the breakers are the blackjack dealers. They don't, they come to work with their blackjack dealer uniform on. They're not buying the cards. They're not buying the, the chips. They're not paying the rent of the table. They're not, you know, making sure that the cards, the chips are being done. They stand there on camera and they deal out the cards and some people win and some people lose. And when they're done with their deal, the winners will take their chips and hopefully turn them in somewhere else for more money. The losers will take their beating and leave, maybe come back if, you know, if, if they want to. And in the back of the house, someone else is packing up the cards. Someone else is making sure that all of the stuff that's being used by that dealer who's front and center on display, that they have the equipment that's needed. And if you're doing it the right way, maybe there's someone else at this casino who's comping you a freebie, a breakfast, okay. a meal for the amount of money that you gambled. You're getting a giveaway. You're getting a show ticket. Maybe there's some entertainment involved. Maybe while you're playing blackjack, there's somebody on stage you know, doing comedy or there's musician, there's live music or something. There are people coming over and offering you drinks to keep you there. There are little little tidbits, little nuggets that are being tossed in to make sure you stay there because the longer you're there, the odds are you're going to give your money to them and lose. So there's always going to be product. doesn't matter mm-hmm. which company is producing it. Now we have virtual selling, which is a new phenomenon. Even in 2018, it wasn't – no one was – like people were buying on Amazon but not buying from like the social – so breaking isn't going anywhere. I, I think breaking is is in a growth phase, 100%. You still think I've it seen, has more upside? Yeah, yeah. And I wow. think what you're going to see is you can see stratas of breakers, right? And you might see some of the little guys who were you know, reliant on breaking whatever product they could get on Instagram, and that was their only platform, and they're just going to sit there. You know, I think you're going to see some consolidation on the platforms between whatnot, Car Shop Live, Loop, I mean, whoever else is doing this. But more importantly, there are going to be breakers who are going to get enough product that they take on sort of like a middleman level. I've seen, maybe we can get him on if you like. I've, I, I broke with him myself a couple times and got trounced. Um, I got in like a National Treasures basketball break 2019. Um, and I think I got like a bowl ball base card. Filth bomb breaks. And I bring up filth bomb breaks because what I've noticed, they used to just break, 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 break. I believe their allocation is such now, they're getting so much of an allocation that I've noticed their posts are, hey, breakers, if you need product, come to us. If you need stuff to break, come to us. 
And what they're doing now, it's almost like a distributor from the distributor. It's almost like they'll break. They have some stuff to break, but they have so much product that I noticed the price that they had for prison football. I'm almost doing a commercial for you, Philip Bomb. You owe me some money. The price they had for prison football was like attractive enough that they could sell it to breakers, and breakers can still break it and make money. You know what I mean? So I think what you're going to see is that, that, like I said, like a stratification of the breakers. I don't want to say licensing of them. You know, there'll be a platform that probably wins. Um, whatnot is clearly the leader in the clubhouse, you know, on that front. And, um, you know, that's... People, people you know, don't realize how good the tech is <clears throat> and whatnot, too. Like, you could do so many cool things with it that it's not just, like, social... Like, you could you could run polls. Slab Stocks yesterday was doing an awesome break of soccer, and they had, like, a wheel. Literally, like, a digital wheel on on there. Yeah. It's, uh, it's incredible. It's a really interesting space that... I, I don't break, Cage, so I'm... I feel like I'm left behind in not that I'm missing out on not being a breaker. I do, I'm trying to learn how they're – do you think – how many breakers, like the actual people that work for these companies, do you think are card collectors? Very few. I don't think they know cards at all. Very few. I think very, very few. I think very few. That is it, – it's an interesting phenomenon. And I'm like I'm missing out on learning their world like – I've been watching more and more breaks. And I'm like, this is fascinating. Like th they run this like dollar auction. Um, it ends somewhere. They're like, we're going to have like 15 boxes and they have like noir basketball and, you know, prism football and optic and contenders. And they're just like, they're opening all these crazy different boxes. Anyway, I'm ranting Luca nation. That's another episode, a little double header. Tracy Hackler was probably, you know, what's funny. I, I never thought of that. I never thought about that, dude. I never thought about whether or not breakers or, are... <clears throat> or hobby people and it's funny I, I mean thinking about that it's i think you might be writer than you realize i think a lot of people who are breaking the product are they you know i think you have to learn once you've done you product have enough, to learn you're gonna well, learn you know but one of them is doing this thing where they're like taking cards and and cracking them and sending them to different grading companies as if this is like revolutionary shit and i'm like we've been talking about that for two years <laughs> yeah, I mean, the crack and resub is, uh, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a new game. Oh man, I mean, listen, I appreciate Tracy coming on. The breaking thing, man, I, I, I don't want it to come across that I'm shitting on it, and I obviously I, I just compared it to blackjack. There is fun there, and I mean, let's let's call a, a call a spade a spade, or you know, call it out, call it true. I remember, you know, at national last year, you know half the people who we were with during the day who were um you know doing cards they were leaving at night to go to a nearby casino it was called rivers casino and they were going to go gamble you know what i mean they were going to go play blackjack they're going to play craps they're going to play roulette now, obviously it was happening in vegas it's part of what you have there so clearly you know i need that dopamine there is, rush there is an overlap good. here right you know like we're all sort of gamblers even cracking and resubmitting is a form of kind of taking a gamble yeah. You know, sure, you think you're better at it than everybody else. You're the one who's going to go in there and counting cards. I'm counting cards. We're, we're counting cards. But it's all a gamble. It's all taking a shot at it to try to, you know, in, you know, increase your return. Um, so I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's a lot of fun. And, and I got to tell you, I'm really looking forward to the National. And one of the things I want to walk through and spend time in is that Breakers Pavilion. And I know that might sound weird from someone who's going to be, you know, almost 46 years old at the time of national. And I should be over in this section with the, you know, the crusty non-graded tobacco cards. Right. And I will. I'll look at that stuff, too. But the hobby has a lot to offer. And that Breaker Civilian is something that didn't even exist a couple of years ago. And now it is like the place. It's going to be loud. It's going to be boisterous. It's going to be like I compared it last time around, like walking through a casino floor where a couple of tables are on a heater. You know what I mean? And yeah, yeah, woo, nice roll, but you know, I mean, like that. It doesn't always happen. What worries me, or what I'm thinking about, all this stuff, guys, is stuff I'm kind of pondering and sharing with you. Because I got a message today. It was a fair message. Like you guys, you know, we love the show. I love the content. Um, what do you think of the one of one poll? You know, you've been staunch defenders of backyard, and I'm like, I. I I think what they do for the hobby is interesting. They have a huge audience. They have a huge audience on TikTok and Twitch, which most of us are like Instagram guys. So it's a different audience, much younger. But what worries me is it's it's a kind of a pay-to-play model 
And the more money you have, sure, maybe you it's it's more expensive to get product, but I'm worried about the little breakers, like and how they are going to be able to compete with some of the juggernauts that are, you know, doing 10, 50, 20, 50, a hundred thousand dollars in sales a week. And from a manufacturer standpoint, the companies that produce the product, I think it's gonna be in their best interest to you know? So can I give you a, a, what I think will happen? Do you yeah. remember two years ago when group submission was the thing? Yeah. And a couple couple of people were, were starting to grow their thing and then just everybody got into group submission. It seemed like you turn around and just like every third collector was doing a group submission, sort of like every third collector is trying to break. And then all of a sudden, the, the companies came up with a what? Do you remember? PSA like verified with a, or like a authorized these are like dealer authorized thing? dealers. These are and, and it didn't really work out, right? One of the one of the dealers, you know, had a, a problem, but it was authorized dealer. And and think about it. Think about it from a logistic standpoint, right? The the group subbers work, and if you have three, four, or five that are doing eighty percent of the business, if you're if you're a distributor out there, if you're somebody who's out there, you know, you know, working with you know, we're working with a breaker. You're going to want to have one shipment to one breaker for a lot of money rather than that same shipment being broken up into 40 different places being shipped across the country that I have to do the labels. I have to worry about this one's actually getting there. I'm getting the phone call for saying this one didn't arrive on time. You know, my, my product got here a day late and now I can't sell it for as much. I mean, if you're just dealing with one company that's probably thrilled, yeah, that's not good. You can go through your narcos cartel, you know, monopoly thing again, but I think you're probably right. I think that what we're going to see is those little guys, just like the little group subbers um, got squeezed. I think you're going to see the little guys get squeezed. I think we're already starting to see it. I would invest I would invest heavily in marketing if I was a breaker. Like I'd realize what you're really doing is opening cards, but what you're really, really doing is uh, marketing for the company that's selling, sending you the product. Like, yeah. I think what I think that's a bigger thing than we realize is how many eyeballs actually are in your break. And if you're able to fill that up and create hype and buzz, that's more attractive to some of these manufacturers than the actual, you know, dollars and cents. That's my two, my opinion on it. Well, my last sentence on backyard breaks, and I'll let you have the last word on it because, you know, you know, it's your, your talking point. We have no relationship with them. You know, there's no sponsorship. There's no nothing there, a whole deal. But we are not blind. You, you know, it's pretty easy to see that every time those guys pull something, the feedback is generally negative. It's like not on Instagram. Guys again, on Instagram. But, yeah. but that's the interesting thing, though. On TikTok and Twitch, it's flipped the reverse. That So fascinated is a neutral comment, right? Fascinated is not good or bad. Correct. I'm fascinated by um, this world because it's. But what weird. do you mean on TikTok and Twitch? I mean, like, is TikTok and Twitch a, a neutral platform, or you mean on TikTok and Twitch, their streams, everybody's happy about it? So, you know how, like, at the lunchroom, there's different tables and, the, like, how it was viewed? Like, on TikTok and Twitch, Backyard is universally beloved. By who? I, I, so that, by, um, by the community that they built. But what community? So here's the difference, right? TikTok and Twitch, everybody has their own channels, right? And and Instagram, it's like a centralized location. You're posting your stuff here, and you can get a reaction. Are you telling me if people go on Twitch and they post on Twitch how much they love backyard breaks, and nobody nobody's calling them out? Like, where are they posting it? What are they saying there? Well, on Twitch you go live, so there's comments, kind of like a YouTube live. Right, but, so the comments are in their own thing, though, right? It's in their own stream, the comments. I would imagine sure, on, if you go TikTok, to Backyard... Go ahead. But on TikTok, it's, it's Instagram. But here's why I think that. Instagram is... It actually skews a lot older than we think. I, I, we don't, but TikTok and Twitch skew a lot younger than we think. Yep, so Backyard's won this 15 to 22, 25-year-old audience. That just blows my mind. Whereas the older hobbyists that are on Instagram are like, whoa, yuck. And, and that, 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 that's what fascinates me. I'm interested. Yeah, I mean, I don't say yuck because I just, I mean, <laughs> you know, you've seen great cards pulled by other breakers. But I think the hobby kind of has to get used to the fact that the same couple of breakers are going to hit all of the good products. It doesn't mean they're the ones getting the cards. Someone's breaking with them. And I, I would venture to say 
that we're talking about these the Steph Curry triple logo man, you know, with the uh, the, the the Warriors and the LeBron one, and this Cade Cunningham one of one. I doubt the same owner, you know, the same person who was paying to get in the break got all three of those. Sure, it happened that it's the same company who's breaking for them, but let's distill it down. If if they weren't breaking it, these products would be in some other consumer's hands who bought the product themselves at an LCS or whatever it is. You know, I think you have to get used to the fact that the bigger breakers are going to be where you see these products hit because they just have have the most. It, it's it would be similar to Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. It shouldn't it surprise comes anybody. Back to a movie. Oh, it shouldn't the surprise book. anybody, right? That Veruca Salt's, you know, dad got a golden ticket. You know, he turned his peanut shucking factory into a opening chocolate bar. The more chances you take, the better your odds that you're going to get that golden ticket. You know, Charlie Bucket only having two chocolate bars wasn't going to get one. You know, he got a little lucky there at the end. Augustus Gloop, you know, he's a fat guy. He eats more chocolate than the rest, right? Mike TV, man. Violet How did Coca-Cola not do a golden ticket all these years? This fucking bullshit. I mean, listen, you understand what I'm saying? The, you know, the more lottery tickets you buy, you would think you have a better chance not to hit the jackpot per se, but to get some of your money back. It's the same kind of thing here, guys. You know, I mean, the breakers are getting the product. It's just what happens. So the, the hits are going to come out of the product, <laughs> you know? Let's just put it this way, guys. I hear your comments. I see your comments. I'm fascinated. I'm like a detective researching, trying to figure out this world. And as soon as I figure it out, I will share with you. Not figure it. it out like there's a crime that I'm finding. Figure Have it you out solved baseball more. yet? Have you figured out how to solve baseball yet? No, no you don't I want usually to. get to third dead. base. And I, I get to third base and I'm like, I'm not you even going to get home. Yeah, <laughs> third is my favorite. I mean, that's a shame. You got to find a different company. Remember how exciting middle school was when it was like, who got to which base, man? I miss, man. This is the first year that I've actually felt old and it sucks. Like I've actually felt my age this year and I'm like, what is going on? I miss being a kid. I mean, it's about time. I mean, you know, it's about time. You're not, you know, you're not 30 anymore. You know, you got to feel old. Eventually, it starts, it starts to hurt to wake up in the morning. Me? I'm not wishing it. I'm just saying it's about time. It's not, I mean, lucky you. I mean, I've felt old since I was like 11. <laughs> I wake up like, oh, my back. <laughs> Maybe that was just being overweight. You know, it is what it is. Maybe it wasn't being old that my back hurt from. Well, I got to tell you, man, this was a fun one. Thank Tracy. Normally, these episodes are a little shorter, but, we, you know, Tracy, instead of, instead of 15 or 20 minutes, talking. We had him on for 30, 35 minutes. That was pretty awesome. Love you, Luke and We'll be back tomorrow. Peace. So thank you all for listening to another episode of Lucas, Tigers, and Bronzo Mai. I wanted to tell you about a new service that we have starting as of today, and I'm really, really excited to bring it to you guys. So as a part of our partnership with SGC, we got 50 free submissions every single month, and many of you have taken advantage of that. And it's amazing that we could have the opportunity to 650 episodes, 675 episodes in, to go ahead and give back to our community. As people were sending those cards in, they asked, can we send 5, 10, 20 more cards to you guys? We'll pay for it, but we wanted them graded with SGC. You guys know SGC is turning cards around in 13 to 14 business days, uh, have incredible customer service, and their secondary market values are going up day after day after day. And that's exciting for the hobby and exciting for the grading landscape. So we didn't want to just rush into it. We wanted to do it right. And what we did was I relocated here to Boca Raton, Florida. I opened up a PO box maybe five minutes away from SGC. And I will be hand delivering and hand picking up the cards. So you don't have to worry about anyone else touching your cards. It will be me. And I will update you every step of the way. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to personally pick up the cards from a P.O. box, prep them, new card saver, new penny sleeve, and deliver them to SGC every single Tuesday. Why Tuesday? Well, it lets the stragglers over the weekend come back through on Monday and gives me a day to prep. And it basically gives SGC the entire week to work on grading those cards. Once your cards pop, only then at the end of the process will you be paying for the service. It's $25 per card. Simple as that. And the turnaround times have never been faster. We're hearing right now 13, 14, less than 20 business days. 
So there it is. 9170 Glades Road. Number 135 is the P.O. Box in Boca Raton, Florida, 33434. 9170 Glades Road. Number 135, Boca Raton, Florida, 33434. Of course, you could shoot me an email or shoot me a text anytime, and I'm always available. Many of you already have my email. It's Goldberg at gmail.com or my cell phone number, 215-519-9154. Reach out with any questions. I could walk you through the process. I've hopped on the call with quite a few of you, and I'm happy to do that. Love you, Luca Nation.